Excellency, Minister Pamestu, Ambassador Moriarty, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. It is a great honor to stand before all of you at the Distinguished Forum to launch this publication of Regional Dynamics in Decentralized uh, Indonesia. And this is a great undertaking to compile and publish valuable writing and studies of great thinkers on the challenges of the decentralization in Indonesia. So I truly appreciate uh, this effort. Um, it's not always easy to speak at this prestigious forum, the Hadis Successful Policy Forum, especially if I have to talk in front of uh, my former teachers. There are several former teachers here, Professor Iwan Adius, uh, Hal Hill, Ibu Mari, and I see also Chris and Anne. And it reminds me of the comprehensive examination. <laughs> um, but this morning, um, I would like to share my view regarding uh, the book edited by Hal Hill. It reminds me with uh, one book produced by Alfred, perhaps about um, 15 years now. It's probably about uh, 25 years ago. Correct me if I'm wrong. Huh? Uh, it's called uh, Unity and Diversity, Regional Development. And that book uh, became a classic uh, for the uh, reference about the discussion about the uh, study about uh, <coughs> regional economy in Indonesia. I think it's about time now to launch the new book, to make a comparison about what we had uh, regarding this decentralization before the 1998 and after the 1998. And I believe this is uh, the objective of publishing this book. And I also appreciate the Australian National University that uh, conducted the Indonesia Day uh, last year about the regional dynamics and decentralization and I believe that this book is proceeding of this conference. But before I uh, share my view regarding this book, uh, not specifically about this book, about uh, regional economy and decentralization, I'm not an expert about this. It's really the field of uh, Professor Yonazis. But perhaps let me share with you about how we look at the Indonesia in the global context and related to the decentralization about the fiscal policy. I believe that in the next 10 or 15 years, we are facing the new world with this maybe unprecedented reform. If we look at what happened uh, with the global financial crisis in 2008, I believe that in the future, the rebalancing must take place. Because I don't think with the current global imbalances, this will persist unless some adjustment had to be done um, in the developed countries, including in the US and in Europe. <coughs> if you look at the, the chronic and acute problem about the current fund deficit, and also the fiscal deficit, both in the US and also in the Europe, <coughs> I believe that the rebalancing this must take place. So I can imagine maybe 10 to 15 years from now, US need to improve their current account problem. It means that there will be a change of paradigm that it has become an exporter in the future. Perhaps at this time, we cannot imagine that because the largest locomotive of trade will still be the advanced country, US and also Europe. And if you look at the problem of the spending of the fiscal deficit in the US, somehow I believe that US need to make some adjustment as well. So perhaps the consumer behavior, the behavior of the economic agent in the U.S. will change from spender to become savers. Similar pattern will happen in Europe. So if this happens, then the question is, who is going to be the locomotive of trade? Because it's no longer U.S., it's no longer Europe. And we cannot expect that U.S. and the Europe will continue to become solely the major driver of economic growth, of the global economy. Then the answer is will be Asia. <clears throat> Why? Because the huge population, the rising middle class, the young population, growing economy. So I can imagine maybe 10 to 15 years from now, the role of Asia become very crucial. And if you're talking about this role of Asia, 
there will be a three major pool of growth in Asia. India with South Asia, East Asia with Japan, China, and Korea, and Southeast Asia with this Indonesia, uh, it's a, Indonesian economy is accounted about 50% of the total of the Southeast Asian economy. And in terms of population, maybe around 42% of the total ASEAN population. So we can imagine that the role of Indonesia, like it or not, will become very crucial in the global context. Um, about a month ago, I believe, because I received notes from Pasik Basu, from the Chief Economist from World Bank, that um, uh, remind me on uh, telling me that Indonesia now has become the 10th largest global economy, including the, according to the uh, TPP, the purchasing power credit. So, uh, about five years ago, six years ago, we were still the 15th largest uh, economies in the world. So putting in that context, then the role of the economic policy become very crucial. Because the question whether Indonesia will be able to improve its ranks in terms of its economic size and also improvement of this Indonesian economy will depend on policy. And there are things that are quite different that we are facing before the 1998 and after the 1998. Last Friday, the Faculty of Economics, University of Indonesia, awarded the Lifetime Achievement to Professor Ali Wardan for his um, achievement as an academic uh, dean of the Faculty of Economics and also as Minister of Finance. He is the only Minister of Finance for 15 years staying in the cabinet. And I remember about my long discussion with Pak Ali Wardana because he kept asking me about this question. Why making this policy at this era is so difficult? compared to his era. So my response to Pak Ali is, during his, in your era was quite easy. As long as you got an ear of the president, you can implement any policy. And at that time, the other thing is, the fiscal policy is more or less very centralized. But now, after the 1998, the political setting is quite different. Because we are facing the multi-stakeholders if I would like to propose a policy, the first thing that I need to do to convince my colleague in the cabinet. Once colleague in the cabinet support this, we need to convince the president. That's it, the cabinet. Once the president support it, we need to convince the parliament. Even though parliament agree, we need to talk with the media, to talk with the people. So selling idea is very important. Then, talk with the local government. Now, this is the role of this local government become very important. Because if you look at our budget now, it's about 30% of the total government budget went into uh, transfer fund to the local government. Nowadays, we are talking about 1,800 trillion government spending. So if we're talking about 30%, we are talking about 600 uh, trillion rupiah transfer to the local government. Then the question is, is does the, the, the role of the central government in, in conducting this fiscal policy still powerful or not? And we are facing some problems here. Uh, let me talk as an economist. Uh, one of the problems with the decentralization of the fiscal balance in Indonesia is the problem of what economists call the principal agent <coughs> The principal is the central government and the agent is the local government. With the directly elected head of districts, Bupati, Wali Kota, etc., they are not directly accountable for the central government. So we gave them money, we transfer fund, but they are not accountable to the central government. So how can you control the local government? Like what our experience in the past, we transfer our money to the local government, they put it in the local development bank, and the local development bank got the Bank Indonesia certificate. But this money went back to the Bank Indonesia. Without the central government, can fully control about this allocation of funds. And every year, we have to transfer about 30% of our total budget. 
So the question about the effectiveness of the budget is related on the, our ability to design mechanism to avoid this principal agent problem. The problem is because the agent is obeying the principle in many cases. We send the money, the, some of the uh, prof, uh, not profits, kabupaten or the local government, they not disperse this money in a proper manner for several reasons, maybe because the lack of the planning, the human capital, etc. Maybe the, because the problem of this, you know, the issue of governance, they are afraid about this anti-corruption committee, um, you know, um, some of the issues. So there are some problems with the local government and not very effective. And for the budget 2015, there will be a new law to be implemented. It is what we call the Undang-Undang Desa. And on top of this Undang-Undang Desa, we need to allocate another 10% of the total transfer fund. So if we're talking about the 600 trillion rupiah now, it means we need to add about 60 trillion to the Desa. And if we're talking about Desa, we are talking about 73,000 Desa of villages. My question is very easy how you can evaluate and monitor 73,000 villages. The central government definitely cannot control this. If you're talking about 17,000 uh, villages, in one year there are only about 365 days. So if you want to monitor, you know, regardless public holiday, Saturday and Sunday, at least for every day you need to evaluate about 200, 300 villages. And the government official cannot do other job unless focusing on monitoring about this data. So this is this will be the new challenge for the uh, new government. Um, the law itself already passed by the parliament, proposed by, interestingly, the uh, two major contenders of this presidential election. So I do hope that once they become a president, they realize about this, the implication of this, you know, the law. If you're talking about governance, then it's not easy, 73,000. But let me, let me talk a little bit about what the government can do. I'm not, I'm not a big fan about, you know, talking about the first best policy, because every time you, you talk about the first best policy, then you get frustrated. Why? Because the institutional setup is not the first best uh, race institution. We need to be realistic that our institution uh, not as good as what in the textbook is assumed. So my approach is very pragmatic. If your institutional setup still in the Jurassic Park, don't come up with the policy, with the quality of policy with Star Wars, because it's not going to work. <laughs> so my question is, is back to the Eco 101. I learned this from Professor Lomazis. <coughs> work within the constraint. This is the optimization. So if the, if you cannot change the institution within a short period of time. Work within that constraint. So what kind of policy still can be done? Because the ideal one is we will have this a very good capacity of the local government, no corruption issue, no issue of the principal agent problem. So if I need to address this issue back to the principal agent problems, theoretically, the only way to solve this problem is to ensure that there is incentive <coughs> and disincentive mechanism to ensure that this agent will obey the principle. That's basically the, you know, the bottom line of addressing the principle agent problems. So that is why we and the central government now start to introduce some policy. But it's not easy because the constraint is the law of decentralization, law number 33, because we already gave all this power to the local government, local taxing power. Um, but there is no basically there is no penalty. And the government 
try to provide some penalty before by introducing some regulations that if the local government do not implement the policy, the central government will holding off the money, the general allocation fund. But you know what happened? The local government they transfer they uh, translate this problem to their people because if the central government do not disperse the money and it is not the head of districts or wali kota who bear the burden, it is their people. So they said that that's fine if the local government doesn't want to disperse the money, then no program of welfare, there is no program of the uh, you know infrastructure. So now we are thinking that maybe we need to introduce the incentive that not only to the region but directly to the head of districts or wali kota. So now we are in the process of introducing the new law. We call it the HKPD, Hubungan Keuangan Pusat dan Daerah. And the interesting part in this law is the government intervention. It's really a micro intervention. Why? If the local government fail to disperse the money for the project, then the government holding off not the general allocation fund, but the salary for the head of districts. By doing this, it is the head of districts who bear the burden. They cannot translate this issue to the to their own people. So we need to come up with some micro intervention like this about the designing mechanism to ensure that this uh, policy could work. I do believe, I'm a great believer that people respond to incentive. So if, but if we provide the wrong incentive, then look at what happened uh, in the past. The central government holding off the general allocation fund, the local government said that's fine for me because it means that our people cannot have an access for clean water, for the hospital, etc. It is the people, not the health districts, not the wali kota. So somehow we need to design uh, about some policies regarding this. Um, if you look at about the experience in other countries like in China, one thing that makes China become very, not, not, I'm not saying that very, effect, uh, uh, very effective, but more or less more effective than many countries in the region, including Indonesia, is because they have this reward and penalty mechanism. In the case of China, maybe the share of the special allocation fund is much higher than general allocation fund. So the central government can use this special allocation fund as an effective tool in order to ensure that the local government will obey the central government. This is exactly the way we address what economists call the principal agent problems. That is why the decentralization in China is much more effective. Now, we start to doing the similar things in the case of our budget, but unfortunately, if you look at the uh, composition in Indonesia, the special allocation fund is much, much higher, bigger than the, sorry, the general allocation fund, it's much, much bigger than the special allocation fund. So it means that the central government doesn't have tools. So the only way to do it, maybe we need to increase the share of special allocation fund to be used as a policy tool in order to ensure that the local government, you know, will implement what the policy designed by the central government. And this makes things the, the fiscal policy quite different before the 98 and after the 98. Yeah. Let me give an example about the 600 trillion money that we transfer to the local government. Every year, we have the surplus in the local government. We call it SILPA. Now, the accumulative of SILPA is already 120 trillion. If the central government got a problem about money now, we need to cut budget, etc. But at the local government, they're holding money about 120 trillion and cannot disperse it for several reasons. So somehow, we need to design this mechanism. I know this new draft of bill about the HKPD, Hubungan Keuangan Pusat Daerah, the regional fiscal balance, the new one, is not perfect. But at least, my point is that a given institution, we need 
to improve this. But despite all this, you know, I don't want to, you know, to continue with this discussing about the problem. So I try to sort of like give an example about how do we address this this this, this issue. But despite all this um, controversial about this decentralization, I would say that there are several improvements that's already taking place. And I think how in this book mentioned about it. The first one is, I recall, it was back in 1998 how in Canberra, I was a student there, that the ANU organized a conference about the future of Indonesia. I believe Marcus was also there. And all, this is the, I think I believe that it was the first time and the only time that the economists and also the political scientists agreed. Because in the, at the time, we believed that no hope for Indonesia. We were talking about the possibility of balkanization back in 1998. If you're talking about the presidential election, we were talking about this no ability of the Indonesian people to have this direct presidential election. If you're talking about economic situation, we had a minus 13% economic growth. Basically, economic, uh, the economic situation is completely collapsed. And all of us agreed that no hope for Indonesia. Then, when we launched the decentralization, one of the key problems that makes people worry is about the uh, in, uh, the uh, possibility of this balkanization, the separation of Aceh, of Papua. Once the government is centralized, there is a threat of this national integration. But when we launched the decentralization in 2001, now it's about 2014, we don't see the major threat come from this decentralization. Somehow, in the last, in the, since 2001, we've been able to maintain about this, you know, the NKRD without a really a major serious threat regarding this national integration. And I think we are making a progress. It's much better than what we thought. When we launched the decentralization in 2001, we um, export everything to the local government, including the corruption from the central government, from the local government, without asking whether the local government needs the corruption or not. <laughs> but, and this is the reality. And uh, the Faculty of Economics, the University of Indonesia, conducted a serious research regarding this impact of the decentralization. And the impact is quite interesting because this is in collaboration with the MBER. Um, when we launched the decentralization back in 2001, the share of this, uh, what we call the extra cost, extra cost means anything that we have to pay besides the legal tax, basically bribes, was around 12% of the total production cost. It means that if you produce something that you pay about 12% of the extra cost. Interestingly, in years after decentralization, the share of this extra cost declined to become 8 to 9 percent. And how do we explain this? Eight years after decentralization, the corruption in the local government is, uh, was declining. And I think the best way to explain about this phenomenon is by looking about this competition about the local government. Among the local government, they compete with each other in order to attract the foreign investment or the other investment to come. And the share of this extra cost declined from 12% to 8%. Of course, 8% or 9% is still high. We see a lot of corruption, but if you compare with 2001, we are actually making a progress. This is a quite interesting development and not many people realize about it. The other thing is from the local government, we find a new champion. We got Solo, now the presidential candidate for uh, Indonesia. Now, if you're talking about Bandung, Wali Kota Bandung, for example, some Kabupaten in Makassar. So the new champions come from this decentralization. But still, a lot of problems, especially related to the issue of this investment climate, etc. But, you know, we see some champions start from this local government. So this is actually the good part of this decentralization. 
And I believe that in the future, we need to continue with this. But there are several issues that we need to improve. The first one is the capacity of the local government, definitely. Sometimes the reason why the local government produce quote unquote not the optimal policy, not because they don't want to, but their capacity is also there. So the role of this education about this, you know, I do believe that I don't know whether the Asia Foundation is still helping the local government from the target A or the etc. I believe that somehow will help to enhance the capacity. The second one is the clear division between the central government and the local government, especially regarding the fiscal issue. We try to address this under this uh, law of uh, HKP. So uh, I'm not going to, you know, to discuss each chapter of this book, Editor Bazaar, but perhaps, you know, what I've been sharing with you, perhaps could become a note on this book because when I look at you know, uh, try to skim this book is quite interesting. One of the chapter talking about uh, delivery of the public service and no guidance, no theoretical guidance. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Neil produced a, a good paper a couple years ago that the success story of some cities not related into the system but depends on the leaders. That's a conclusion in Manado and also some other cities. So the issue is more, we have not been able to institutionalize the, the system, but it really depends on the leaders. And I believe this would be the challenge of the future uh, decentralization. So I believe that the book of the regional dynamics in decentralized Indonesia try to cover some of the above challenges and issue and present some interesting <coughs> and recommendations I really encourage comment, input, and critics, ideas also from the various stakeholders about the issue in decentralization. I remember about three years ago, uh, uh, I was talking in the, uh, in the Kennedy School with, I forgot his name, he's the one who designed this decentralization in Mexico. About, you know, one of the interesting comments that come from him is, one of the problems in Indonesia is that the government really doesn't have these tools to make the local government to, you know, to uh, obey the policy made by the central government. In the case of India, somehow, they have some tools. But we try to, to improve this by the HKPD introducing this hubungan, kekuasa, uh, hubungan keuangan pusat dan daerah. I know this is not perfect. This will be discussed by the parliament, but various input comments from you I believe that will be very useful, especially after we launch this book. So once again, uh, in my conclusion, I would like to convey my sincere gratitude to Professor Carl Hill for his tireless effort to put this book together, as well as the ANU Indonesia Project and CSIS, which has contributed to this endeavor. Thank you very much.
uh, a dance into the system, whatever uh, dancing uh, will mean, we'll find out more. But I think Hadisu Sastro, uh, just to close on, on uh, uh, my remarks on Hadisu Sastro, I think Hadisu Sastro's footprints can be found everywhere, not just in CSIS, but in the architecture of ASEAN, Asia Pacific, and uh, a lot of the discussion we have on political economy of reform uh, that uh, he has had so much input in. And even, uh, you know, he was there at the birth, at, at the, he was present from the beginning uh, of the evolution of APEC in 1989. I think Patsumadi will, will know this very well. And oversaw the birth of ASEAN and its evolution, including the creation of the ASEAN Economic Community. And I was just rereading uh, a paper that Ahadi did with Anthate Basri, dated 2005. Uh, talking about bilateral FTAs and the importance of Indonesia uh, to negotiate uh, bilateral FTAs. I think at that time we were just starting the, our EPA with Japan. Uh, and he was actually very much involved uh, giving us advice uh, and input on the bilateral FTA we had uh, with Japan. And uh, more recently his leadership was when he was uh, at the end of his, uh, in, in the 2000, 2010 period, his leadership was quite strongly in the region's navigation of various crises. And it was crucial, I think, in, the, in fostering the post-crisis emergence of East Asia as the world's highest growth region. I think you can find his footprints everywhere. And one of his uh, last uh, things that he wrote, this was probably dated about April 2010, so about one month before he passed away, Asia's looms large, Asia looms large in the new global economic and political re reality. Resolving global challenges, economic, political, social, human security and environment in the 21st century. And this will require strong international norms, rules and cooperation, as well as effective regional mechanisms for implementation and action. This suggests the importance of re-examining Asia's reg regional institutional architecture which I think we're still, we are still having this debate uh, today. Uh, and uh, I, I just want to close with a personal remark and then say a few words about uh, the importance of a policy forum such as what we're having today. Uh, the, the last uh, personal thing that I, I, I was looking through my email uh, that I received from Ahadi was a Christmas letter to his friends uh, in December 2009. Christmas 2009 is meant to be one that changes the way I view life. And yet, I see no reason why this Christmas is not a cause for celebration. There is something important about the notion of these two simple words, to be, existence, life, relations to nature, and the higher order of things that I'm learning from the experience of trying to deal with an illness. And I want to share this with you. Please join me in lighting a candle to life and all there is to it. So even in his darkest moments, he was still smart. He still had um, uh, optimism. Uh, and that's actually where I want to just say a final few words on the optimism and the way uh, that had his footprints on policy, on the way we see policy is important. And the can lighting the candle of life is, I want to make sure that we continue to light the candle on good policy which is what uh, Hadi and I hope CSIS will continue to be about. And that's why I, I think the best way to remember Hadi is through this uh, policy forum that we're having today. And I'd like to thank the FAD Indonesia Project for uh, supporting this initiative. And today, actually, we, we already had a good start with uh, our Minister of Finance giving us, uh, you know, uh, I guess, moment-to-moment -moment update on, on real policy in action and the constraints one has in uh, trying to have first best policy uh, because of institutional constraints and political uh, constraints. And uh, Hal and I were having this conversation last night how Hadi in one of the seminal uh, papers he wrote on a political economy of reforms or the difficulties of doing reforms in Indonesia, he said that in the past uh, era it was low politics where uh, as Hadi just mentioned, it's as long as you have the ear of the president at the time, and you use all kinds of ways to persuade the president, and one of the <coughs> easiest ways 
what's <coughs> crisis? There's a crisis that's going to happen if you don't do this. And then you have the early president, then you could do the reforms. That's low politics. I guess now uh, we are in high politics. Uh, and that's exactly what David described just then, <coughs> how you must convince so many stakeholders. And, and that's the reality that we have today. And uh, today we have good uh, start with what uh, Hati Basri just uh, started out with, and we will be talking about a very topical issue that Iwan will be you know, dynamics that we are facing. Uh, and we will be addressing topic of very important topic of regional uh, decentralization and so on. And in fact, I do recall that volume how I think I wrote the chapter on Kal Kalimantan Timur, and I also helped Bahadi write the chapter on East uh, of Tintin at the time. And it was a very valuable experience. 25 years later, I, maybe you should do another one if you still have. Oh, and you want, yeah, you want to wrote, I think you wrote it. And Chris, so everybody that was, and Anne, yeah. So a lot of people were involved uh, in that, in that uh, venture. So I think, I just want to, to close uh, with that remark on the importance of policy debate, healthy policy debate, even more so today when we are having a lot of discussion about uh, the uh, VCVC uh, of the two chakras. <laughs> Uh, and this is where we really need to make sure that we you know, have a good policy debate on what is really uh, all this about. It's not just about the, uh, 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 the image, imagery that we are seeing now. And you have to go beyond the political rhetoric uh, and see what is it really all about. What is this uh, policy that is really about. And it needs to be done in an independent, objective way. A good policy debate, you can agree to disagree. Uh, this kind of environment is really what we hope uh, can be contributed by such a policy forum. And I think to, to remind us of what Bahadi said um, about having the candle of life, let's have the candle of policy, good healthy policy debate, continue to be alive and well and alive and continue to burn. Uh, because this is going to be an important, very important component of democracy and uh, good civil society. Without that, I think we cannot have uh, good consolidation and good development of democracy. So that's uh, that's it. I think we need to. Uh, I didn't want to talk too long because uh, we we do uh, have to uh, have a few more. There's a long session uh, after this. I just wanted to again uh, remind us of all that we remember of uh, Bahari, uh, Mingi, uh, and uh, the importance of the policy debate. Uh, I thank you and I thank you all and all the speakers that will speak today uh, that we can remind, that we can remember uh, Bahari with, uh, I hope and I'm sure, it's going to be a very exciting and very interesting policy forum. Thank you very much. Asia in the current global utility taxing system. We also kindly invite Dr. Anton Gunama from the University of Indonesia and as a moderator, Dr. Dispanzi Magenta. Gentlemen, the floor is yours.
but Asia, we will know what Asia is. Uh, is from Istanbul all the way to Hokkaido. But in recent times, we understand it much more in the context of ASEAN plus six, yeah, India uh, to the east. And as I said, uh, it's going to really influence the way economies in our part of the world going to develop in the years to come. We are faced with a lot of problems. We are faced with territorial disputes, which tends to get hotter and hotter every day. We are faced with maybe we are yet to realize this. Apparently, East Asia is sliding into a low path growth. Growth is accelerating in all Asia, including China. And we are all faced with severe deficit of infrastructure, connectivity. We are faced with the cost of hyper growth of the past. We are faced with inequality including in China, extreme inequality in China, and we are faced with regional grouping of early nature, or we are faced with equity, we are faced with asset, etc., etc. But we are also faced with very volatile flows of liquidity, and I think we are going to hear a lot about this from our friends, Iwan Jaya Aziz. He needs no introduction, I think, but he's director of the graduate study at the regional science program of the Cornell University, as well as a young professor uh, at the Johnson Graduate School at the same university. Uh, he is head of the Office of Regional Economic Integration of the ADB. I think we were the first to have this office at ADB and under his leadership, this office has produced a lot of uh, reports on economic integration in Asia and has reached out to the region in trying to promote or closer integration and cooperation among the economies of uh, Asia, particularly in East Asia. Uh, if you go to his website, he's very prolific writers. Uh, his latest publication includes Capital Market in the Context of Financial Safety Net, published by Ox Oxford University Press in 2014 as well as regional science matters. Regional science matters. It matters a lot, published by Springer in 2014. Uh, we will have Pak Anton Gunawan to discuss the presentation by uh, Pak Iwan. And without further ado, let me invite Pak Iwan Jasakusai Aziz to make his presentation. I leave it to you. Yeah.
It's, it's really a wonderful time for me when I was contacted last year to give a lecture for my so I had no second thought, immediately I accepted. And I also think that it's not only Indonesia who lost a good scholar, good intellectual, but I think the whole region, Asia, because I think you hear this morning everyone talk about how his involvement in the region, not just in Indonesia, but to some extent also in the world, because the number of times you know, he visited the US, I met him at the CSIS in Washington and in other institutions. To me, he is like the voice of Asia, uh, especially in the global community. So it's really my honor to be here to celebrate the life of Hamish uh, but of course, I'm also happy to see old friends, um, including ex-students around the room. Uh, it is precisely because of Hadi uh, stature. It's not only for the country, Indonesia, but also for the regions. I decided to pick this topic uh, about the global liquidity, but how it affects the region. Uh, I remember a number of times I had a discussion with Hadi about precisely this topic. So I immediately recall uh, a number of points that we agree as well as disagree. So what I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes is really uh, my ideas about what is going on uh, in the last few years, especially after 2008. I think if we want to go back, uh, we didn't have to go that far. We can start it from the early 2000s. So, you all still recall the world largest economy, that is the US economy, was in recession in 2000. And it's always the case when the economy is in recession, they try to stimulate the economy. And one way to do it is by lowering the interest rate. So, if you follow the US federal fund rates beginning in 2000, it started to go down. But that was normal. And it started to become less normal after the 9-11, that's 2001. And all of a sudden, the fall of the US federal rate accelerated. I remember from 2001 to 2003, so just within the period of two years, the US fund rate dropped as much as five times. So 500% drop. Now, if this happened in other countries, it may not have repercussions on the rest of the world. But we are talking about the world largest economy. Any change in their policy will have repercussion. But then, beginning in mid-2000, uh, Alan Greenspan started to see the threat of bubble. So they raised the interest rate. Again, they raised it as much as five times. But of course, now it became history what happened in 2007. December 2007, officially the US fell into recession. And they reduced the interest rate. And then came September 2008, which borrowing the term that the party was used earlier, it's an unprecedented event. That is the collapse of Lehman Brothers. And that was really the beginning of new thing. And I cannot elaborate more in the session because of the time constraint, but almost everything changed since then, including my discipline. Even economics as a discipline started to lose respect to not just among economists, but also for non-economists, because many concepts that we learned started to be questioned in terms of the effectiveness of it. I'm talking about economic policies. But nothing is more dramatic than the decision made by Ben Bernanke, the, the federal research uh, governor after Adam Greenspan, when we started to introduce the QE, I 
think my now colleagues in Asia, including in Indonesia, are so familiar with the QE that is the quantitative easing. Again, this is very unprecedented. As a teacher, I immediately look at the textbook. <coughs> of course, textbook on monetary economics. And I couldn't find any example of that. I asked my colleagues at Cornell as well as another university, the monetary economists, professors, they all told me the same thing. It's nothing like this. So it is indeed unprecedented. Now, what is interesting is that that's something happened in the US, but what is interesting is that people do not realize that the repercussions of that event it's so huge to the rest of the world, but today I'm trying to focus only on Asia. The impact is so huge, but I'm, I understand if the hugeness or the enormous size of the impact is not fully realized in many of the Asian countries. I understand that because, as just one mentioned, Asia feels all kinds of problems, inequality, lack of infrastructure, and so forth. So they're busy with all those. So in a way, it's a, my small contribution or my small reminder uh, this morning that there is something big outside uh, Indonesia, outside regions, which affect us in a very significant way. What is the immediate impact? Well, when you have very low interest rates, any capitalist, any institution, household, individuals who has capital, they try to look for higher returns in other places, as simple as that. When the interest rate in the US went down as much as 0.25%, as of today, unless something happened last night which I didn't follow the news, today is 0.25%. When you have that low interest rate, plus, and this is another important, plus the QE at the same time, that is the purchase of 85 billion US dollar per month by the US Federal Reserve, when you have that kind of situations, it doesn't need to be rocket scientists to know what happened with that capital, where does that capital go? They are looking for high return. And the destination happens to be there. That's the emerging market economies. And I think it's no secret that among emerging market economies in the world, Asia is one of the most favored, including Indonesia. So it is precisely because of this, I try to look at a little bit more detail not only the size, but also the nature and the intensity of the global liquidity flows. And here is a number of points that I want to share with you. You know, capital inflows, massive capital inflows, is not a new phenomenon. It's an old phenomenon. And also, it's not new when you have massive capital inflows. Usually, that's uh, the beginning of a sign of a crisis. Because you started with capital inflows, and then you suffered from capital outflows. So you have a reversal of flows. And when capital reverse, that's the crisis. So that's not new. But what is new now is that well, I, I remember there are five things with this new, which is different this time than in the past. Number one is the size. I think in the paper that uh, I noticed it was shared among all of you, the size of the capital inflows that come to Asia pre-1997, I think we all know here what happened in 1997. Pre-1997, it's nothing compared to the size of the capital flows this time. Huge, enormous size of the capital flows. The second and more important thing is not the size, but the volatility of the capital flows. 
much, much more for the time. And number three, the driving force of this capital flows, as I started with uh, my, my talk uh, the last few minutes, is really the push factor, global supply push factors of capital. That is what happened in the US. By the way, I didn't mention about Europe, but basically if you follow the trend in Europe, it's similar. The interest rate by the ECB, the European Central Bank also dropped. So, you know, we are talking about two biggest economies in the world, US and Europe, and they changed unprecedentedly their policy on monetary affairs. So that had a significant effect. So the second is volatility. And the third is the source. It's really more global boost. Because usually when we talk about capital flows, it has to be two. The boost and the pull factors. So it takes two to tango to have this capital flows. But this time, predominantly is the push factor. What happened in the advanced economies. The third, and this is very, very important, I'm sorry, the fourth. I'm getting older, but I mentioned already the third. The fourth. You know, if you look at the Asian economy, it's almost like looking at the movie with the two sequels, sequel one and sequel two. What is sequel one? Sequel one is pre-1997, pre-Asian financial crisis. What was the title of the Asian economic movie there? The title is Excess Investment, because we know in Asia at that time was booming, they invest a lot, and yet they didn't save a lot. As a result, they were brought, shortened, untaxed in foreign currency. That brought down leading to crisis in July 1997. But the sequel number two is the post-1997, until now actually. The title of the movie of Asia is Excess Safety. If you look at the data of the investment and saving in the region collectively, no doubt there is an excess saving. So the point I'm trying to say here is, point number four is that, in addition to massive capital inflows, the region has a huge saving. So when you put this together, what does it mean in terms of liquidity? What does it mean in terms of liquidity? Enormous amount of liquidity. Enormous amount of liquidity. So I thought I need to start with this to enter the crux of the issues that I'm going to share with you and which I wrote in that short paper. That is the behavior of agents. I think Hadid was correctly mentioned. When we talk about economic, especially economic policy, basically we are talking about response to incentive system, response to something which is happening around you. But who are you here? Well, economic agents. You have households, you have uh, banks, you have corporate sectors, you have government, as well as with fund managers. So, let me now talk about the behavior, the response of these economic agents given this massive liquidity more others coming from the capital flows. Before we look at the individual behavior, what I try to look at is, is there any chains or any dynamics in the capital flows that I was talking about, in which the amount is massive, it's volatility is high. And the answer is yes. So just for the sake of simplicity, we can classify into three phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase one started precisely when I began my talk this morning, and that is, when the U.S. Federal Reserve started to go down. That's phase one. And that lasted even until 2007, when the U.S. 
came into the session. What is the story in that phase, phase one? The story is use of the capital flows were intermediated by the banking sector. For simplicity, I link it bank-led flows. That is capital flows led to the banking sector. That's phase one. But then, as I indicated earlier, QE started when U.S. Federal Reserve started to purchase $85 billion per month of the securities in the U.S. We are entering phase two. What happened? The massive capital inflows is <coughs> featured by what I call debt led flows. That is the period where Raghuram Rajan, who is now the governor of the RBI, who is the Bank of India, labeled as search for yield. So all of a sudden, the holders of securities, ports, market, equities, and so forth, in advanced economies, they started to feel the pinch because the yield went down there. So they are searching for higher yield. And similar story like in the case of the bank flows, they find the alternative destination <coughs> that offer higher yield. And that's emerging markets, including Asia, including Indonesia. So if you look at the trend of the capital flows that goes to the bonds market, and I'm talking about local currency bonds market, as well as equity market after 2009, because the QD started in 2009 actually, after 2009, unprecedented. In fact, the latest statistic I look at for Indonesia, more than one third of the holder of rupiah bonds, the foreigners, so held by the foreign uh, investors. So, phase one is bank like flows, phase two is debt like flows. What is the implications in terms of the behavior? Well, we can immediately judge during the phase one when the massive flows is really bank like flows. The protagonist is the banks. Whereas in phase two, the protagonist is fund managers. This is the reasons why we really want to understand how the response to this trend of massive capital flows. We have to understand the behavior of both the banks up to 2009 and fund managers post-2009. So, before I move to the behavior, let me end with phase three, because I, so far I only explained phase one and phase two. Let me end with the phase three. What happens during the phase three? Well, unofficially, phase three began in May last year. I think most of you still recall <coughs> May last year, that was the first time the US Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, announce, just announce, the possibility of QD tapering. There was no tapering, it was just announcement. No actual tapering announcement. But markets in Asia, including Indonesia, rattled already. That's the beginning of history. And we still do not know what will be the end story of history. In fact, we discussed a number of uh, policymakers in Asia, including in Indonesia with Hatipasri, they seem to agree that this time will be even more difficult in phase three because it's not only because of the QE tapering, but the reversal of interest rate in advanced economies may come. They know and they are sure about it, but of course no one knows when. That's always a mystery in economic policy. They don't know when, but they know it's coming. So in other words, if this happened, it will not only reproduce what happened during the phase one and phase two, but it will also affect the liquidity because when the interest rate and advanced economy started to go up, I think there will be some difficulty in terms of liquidity of a number of emerging market economies. So now let me 
look at the behavior here. First thing first is to look at different agents. So what I try to look at, number one, is the behavior of the households, the behavior of the banking sector, the behavior of the corporate sector, corporate non-financial sector, what I mean, the government and the fund managers. Now, I elaborated in the paper, but given the time constraint here, let me just summarize. Nothing has changed in terms of the behavior. That is the following. When you receive huge amount of money through capital flows, and by the way, this money is relatively cheap. When you have huge amount of money, relatively cheap money, it's not economics as the discipline that can make prediction that the response or the behavior of the agents become risky, become riskier. Again, it's nothing dramatic and it's not economics who can predict that. Even psychologists, sociologists, they can predict that. Even non-scientists can predict that. When you have a lot of money and that money is cheap, you become risky. So, in a way, what I've been trying to do in the last few years collecting this data, it's nothing dramatic. Now, the question is, what kind of information I can get this from? Unfortunately, it's not many, because most of the study looking at the capital flows that you can balance of payment, that doesn't help, because the flows data in the balance of payment is not detailed enough, and it cannot really capture the behavioral response of the agents. So after searching a number of methodology, a number of data set and so forth, I came to my selection and that is flow of fund data. What shocked me is that not only in Indonesia, in a number of Asian countries, by the way, all countries around the world, they have flow funds data. But what shocked me is, is a number of countries in the region hardly use that flow fund data. So I, I sometimes question, you know, if you look at the flow of funds, it's, it's an enormous information and it's not cheap to produce that. So I question myself, why should they spend resources, energy and so forth? collect this information if they don't use it. But that's the side, uh, beside the story. The point is that with the flow of data, we can immediately sort of detect what happened with the response of different agents. Because in the flow of data, in the column, you have different institutions. You have households, you have corporate sectors, you have government, you have SOE, state of enterprise, you have foreign, players and so on. So it's very, very uh, detailed in terms of the uh, breakdowns. And again, since my main goal is to understand how the behavioral response of different agents, given that story that I was telling you, the massive capital inflows, I use this information. And the conclusion is, as I said, it's not surprising. Everybody becomes riskier. Let me pick the case of the financial sector. Majority banks, but not only banks. They call it financial sector, but including non-bank financial sectors. If you look at the balance sheet, because no fund is basically balance sheet, except it's a balance sheet of a country rather than a balance sheet of a company. If you look at the balance sheet of the banking sector, all of a sudden, on the liability side, so on the left hand side, I hope it's still on the left because sometimes I remember when I was students, one of my teachers showed the balance sheet but the liability is on the left side. I mean, it doesn't matter left or right, but I'm talking about the liability side. If you look at the liability side, all of a sudden, what I call the non-core liabilities surge went up dramatically. And this is precisely consistent with the story of bank lab flows that I indicated earlier. So all these monies 
in the emerging market, including Asia, through the banking sector, and that elevated the size of the balance sheet of the banking sector. The reason I call it non-core, because you know, in any bank, operation is the so-called core liability is deposits. If you put your money in the bank, that's the core liability of the bank. But this is not that. So anything that is not that. Now, in, in the book, because I, I wrote only short paper for this session, but there was a book, I, I, I described in detail the definitions of non-core. And I found out that in different countries, you have to use different definitions of core. For example, let's take China. In China, what happened is that during this period of massive capital inflows, people always ask, well, but your story may not apply to China, because as you know, China financial sector in the 2000 period is still closed. So that means bank, banking sector in China cannot accept this capital inflows. Well, but the story is the following in China. The capitals coming to Hong Kong, and then the Hong Kong banks lend to corporate sector in China. And if you look at the balance sheet of the corporate sectors in China, on the liability side, there is dollars in the liability side. That's from the Hong Kong. But then the corporate sector in China spend on the asset side in renminbi, in local currency. What do they use that renminbi? Of course, for their operation. But a lot of them was deposited in the banking sector in Hong Kong. So in a way, Similar effect, like in other countries, is happening in China, except this time the, uh, the non-financial sector